So welcome to our fourth webinar over the longevity series. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about the importance of nutrition and heart health. This webinar will be recorded and uploaded tomorrow already on our YouTube channel. So if you have to leave early or want to share it with a friend, um, we will send out this channel uh, as well tomorrow. Throughout the presentation, please uh, write any questions you may have in the Q&A box and um, not in the chat box because but now it's not working anyway, so that is okay. So that way the questions will be saved. So if we don't get time to answer everything, we will be able to send out an email after the webinar for those questions we're not able to answer today. So going to the next slide, my name is Frida. I'm a registered dietitian at Create Cures Foundation, which is founded by Dr. Walter Longo. I'm working here with Katie, as well as a couple of other wonderful dietitians. My background, I did both my undergrad in nutritional science, my master's was in nutrition, health span, and longevity, and now I'm doing my PhD in clinical nutrition. And uh, I'm very enthusiastic about nutrition and fasting and using these strategies and tools to really optimize our, our health span and longevity. So tonight, we're very excited. We're going to talk a lot about heart health and to learn more about how we can protect our heart by using the principles from the longevity diet. Yay, yes, I'm so excited to be here as well. My name is Katie Rines. I'm also a registered dietitian with Dr. Walter Longo's Create Cures Foundation. And I could not be more excited about our heart disease presentation. My cookbook, the heart disease cookbook came out last year in May and researching for that cookbook, oh, there's just so much incredible research that I can't wait to share with you. I have a master's in human nutrition and I've been plant-based for over 10 years. And the longevity diet book by Dr. Longo is has been so inspiring for me. It's such an honor to get to work at his clinic and to help people really optimize their nutrition. It's so, so, so fulfilling. So previous webinars we have had, these are recorded, these are on YouTube. If you missed out, definitely check these out. Our first one was the longevity diet summarized and some bullet points here, basically the longevity diet, it is whole plant foods based including low mercury wild caught fish two to three times a week at about four ounces a serving and it is time restricted we recommend a 12 hour 12 to 14 hour overnight fast that's longevity diet and then oh my goodness so many questions how am i going to get enough protein am i getting enough protein the protein and longevity webinar you really i recommend watching that one as well we for sure recommend getting your protein mostly from plant-based sources making sure that you're not taking in too much protein. We help our patients optimize to make sure that you're on the lower end of adequate, so you're not taking in too much. And of course, there is increased need in specific populations like athletes, pregnancy, and older adults. All right, so last month on our last webinar, we did talk a lot about fasting, all the different types of fasting, the pros and the cons of the, of the different ones. Um, we concluded that the most realistic fast for most people, it's most sustainable and more realistic to do is the 12 to 12 hour time restricted feeding window, which consists of 12 hours of eating, let's say from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And then you have 12 hours of fasting, 12 p.m. No, I'm, excuse me, 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. the following day. Uh, we also talked a lot about the importance of including breakfast and to follow a whole foods dietary pattern. Again, all these webinars are recorded, so please make sure to check them out uh, on our YouTube channel if you haven't already. We have promotions going on 30% off. Thank you for coming to this webinar with code WebinarHeart2022. That's 30% off of an initial consultation with one of the dietitians at the Create Cures Foundation. You can go to the website clinic.createcures.org and this expires September 18th. Do not miss out. I wanna make sure that you are optimizing your health, optimizing your nutrition, this 30% off. Hopefully I get to get in contact with y'all and have a con consultation with you. And if you're interested, there is a masterclass. This also counts for credits. If you are a medical professional, a longevity nutrition masterclass, that's 30% off if you go to the website, educationcreatecures.org. And that also expires in September. 
before we begin, it looks like we're going to be using the um, has anybody gotten the chat box to work? If you have, um, go ahead and use the chat box. But if not, the Q&A panel works at, for now as well. Why yes. do you want to learn more about nutrition and heart health? It's so important with all of our patients that we get to the bottom of the root. Why? What is the point of this? Why are we attending this webinar? Why do we want to learn more about heart health? Go ahead and answer in the Q&A box. Let's see or if you can in the chat box, but it looks like that's not open for anybody at the moment. All right. So people are saying it looks like someone said I'm older and overweight. Any further answers? There's lots of reasons why you would wanna learn more about heart health. And I just wanna take a step back and make sure everyone is clear that we wanna live our best lives, right? You wanna be able to live healthier longer. So not only maybe you have some risk factors, maybe heart disease runs in your family, maybe you currently are struggling with heart disease, um, whatever that is, we're gonna really get the clear picture that, oh my gosh, we wanna be happy, healthy, and worry-free from disease down the road. Yeah, so get excited about, so that we can get excited about learning. So on this presentation, we're going to be going over what is cardiovascular disease, the causes, the treatments, prevention, how to truly prevent rather than just treat the symptoms, nutrition takeaways, and there will be a quiz and questions throughout. So make sure to pay attention and open up that Q&A feature so that, ooh, okay, now I'm finally seeing some answers here. Thank you, everybody. People have high cholesterol, support a long and healthy life and health span. Yes. Realizing you need to get serious about living a healthy life. Thank you so much for participating. I love these answers. So definitely keep answering the quiz questions and throughout, if you have questions, um, do be sure to ask in the Q&A box as well. And we'll go back and answer those at the end. All right. Open up that Q&A box. What is the number one cause of death in America? What is the number one reason people pass away? What's the number one cause of death? Heart attack, heart disease, heart disease, cardiovascular disease, myocardial infarction, MI. Yeah, it seems pretty clear. The name of this webinar, yes, it is heart disease. And according to the CDC, the number one leading cause of death in America is still heart disease above cancer, above COVID, above all other causes. So even if you have diabetes, you're probably more, you're more likely to die from heart disease than you are from diabetes. And this is really sad because in the literature, uh, there was an article, um, a journal article published in 2018 that quoted that up to 90% of cardiovascular disease may be preventable if established risk, fa risk factors are avoided. 90%, that's a huge number and it's the leading cause of death. So let's actually get to the root cause, let's prevent this. What is cardiovascular disease? So it's a class of diseases that involve the heart or the blood vessels. And basically the main cause of most heart diseases is what's called atherosclerosis. Athero in Latin, it's in reference to matter inside. And sclerosis, that means in Latin, the hardening of tissue. So it's really the hardening of these blood vessels. And I'm going to show you in this video here, the blood cells are just having trouble moving through the blood vessel because there is plaque buildup, cholesterol buildup, saturated fat, and inflammation going on, making it almost impossible for the blood to flow through the blood vessel. That's what atherosclerosis is. And atherosclerosis can lead to heart attack, stroke, and of course, heart failure. So heart failure, it's an inability of the heart to supply sufficient blood around the body. And coronary artery disease, that's CAD, that means the blood vessels that flow to the heart versus peripheral artery disease, those are the blood vessels around the body. Cerebrovascular, that's to the brain. So atherosclerosis in any part of our body, this could happen. It's really scary and it's really sad and it's caused from nutrition and lifestyle really. Also arrhythmias are under the umbrella of cardiovascular disease. That's when your heart beats on an irregular rhythm. Let's see. Oh. 
All right, so as Katie mentioned, 90% of cardiovascular disease can actually be prevented if we avoid certain risk factors. So what are some of these risk factors that we can really prevent? So first of all, high intake of processed and pro-inflammatory foods lead to high triglyceride levels. And this is a problem because this can contribute to hardening of the arteries, like we saw in the video, or the thickening of the artery walls. And this can increase the risk uh, of stroke, heart attack, and overall heart disease. And uh, all these types of foods that are processed, foods with trans fat, added sugar, and refined carbohydrates, uh, such as this picture here. I think this picture reflects basically a recipe for, a recipe for heart disease, um, just because it's all processed, it's refined carbs, it's all the sugar, it's deep fried, the trans fat. And um, also other risk factors are alcohol and smoking. Alcohol consumption can rise the levels of the fat in the blood. Uh, smoking increases the formation of plaque in the blood vessels. Another big uh, risk factors is not like being inactive. This can also lead to fatty material buildup in the arteries. Um, high blood pressure makes a person also at increased risk. So. When we look at all these risk factors, except really the family history of cardiovascular disease, we are all in control of all these factors. So there's so much we can do. So instead of kind of being a victim of like, oh, well, my genetics are bad and all my parents had heart disease. Well, as we were talking about, 90% can of these risk uh, or 90% of cardiovascular disease can actually be prevented as long as we take action and are take action and are in control of our choices. Yes, thank you, Frida. So when it comes to the cause of heart disease, which is avoiding these lifestyle factors here, what is actually the way that the majority of heart disease gets treated right now, as far as in the hospital? It is with medications and medications, they do have their place, right? This is going to be super, super helpful when we need them. However, at the end of the day, this is actually putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. As time goes on, this issue isn't being reversed. It's just simply masking some symptoms. It's like if you get a cut on your foot and instead of really taking care of the wound, you just take some painkillers and just try to ignore the problem. So we really want to get to the cause of the problem. And the medications that are most commonly prescribed are reducing blood pressure medications, and that includes nitroglycerin drugs. If you've heard of nitroglycerin, this is a class of drug that vasodilates. So that means it helps the blood vessels open up. It helps with blood flow. If you've heard of Viagra, that is a nitroglycerin drug. And we're going to get into nitrates that work really similarly to nitroglycerin drugs, but those are naturally occurring in lots of plant foods as well as cholesterol lowering drugs. So these include statin medications. And unfortunately, statin medications, they do have a lot of side effects. Like this woman in the picture, she's holding her back. A very common cause of, or excuse me, a very common side effect is slight muscle pain, as well as headaches, belching or excessive gas. And a huge one is difficulty sleeping and not being able to get into a deep sleep. So statin treatments and cholesterol lowering drugs, they do affect your brain because our, our brains, they do need cholesterol. Our bodies need cholesterol. So it's really interesting when we start taking in medications to, to manage our heart disease, it's kind of a ripple effect. What will affect other parts of the body and down the road, if you're only using medications to treat heart disease, odds are you're going to need more and more as time goes on. And it's actually still, you could still have a heart attack and die of heart disease while taking these medications. Statin treatment reduces cardiovascular mortality by about 31%, whereas removing the cause, right, zero to moderate alcohol consumption, quitting smoking, avoiding processed foods, and all right, everyone take a deep breath right now. Managing stress, that's a big one. Even if you go to the doctor and you're stressed out, your blood pressure is going to be really high. Even if you do eat a healthy diet, making sure you're managing your stress, taking time to relax, engaging in physical activity and maintaining a healthy, let's say healthy weight. These things, the statistic before was 90% about, yeah, 50% or more of 
heart disease deaths could be prevented from removing the actual cause of the problem. Here, I'm going to click this link. I think it's really cool to point out that there are options to see, okay, what is my risk? And I'm quickly going to go through this. So I'm 28 years old. I'm a female. I'm 5'6". I'm about 130 pounds and I'm Caucasian. So this is a cool link. You can look this up or we can share this in the chat box. Um, I've never had any of these before, thank goodness. Um, my parents definitely have not, thank goodness. My parents are plant-based. I'm really grateful <laughs> that they've watched Forks Over Knives and been inspired by me. I definitely have not watched, or excuse me, I've not smoked any cigarettes. Um, I don't have diabetes and you know your total cholesterol. I don't know them right now. Um, I'm pretty sure my blood pressure recently, something like 114 over 80, and I don't take blood pressure medication. And I love working out. So I do get at least 75 minutes of physical activity every day. Um, as far as fruits and vegetables, yes, I definitely eat five or more servings. And I do not eat animal products for the most part. So I'm gonna say zero to one servings of animal products. For me, my heart disease risk is only 4%. So that's a really great number. Um, I invite you all to do a risk calculator like this. It's really cool because it gives you actions to take, making sure that you're eating healthy foods and maintaining weight, don't smoke or use tobacco. So this is something that you can all check out. Let's see. Yeah, Katie, now the chat is also working. So for the questions we can use. Yay, oh, thank you, Frida. All right, everybody open up their chat box, please. Does inadequate intake of vegetables and fruits increase, increase risk for heart disease, yes or no? If you don't take in enough fruits and vegetables every day, are you at higher risk of heart disease? Hey, Rachel, what's up? Hey, yes, 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 yes. All right, everyone is very clear. We need to be eating two to three cups of vegetables every single day, get in a couple of fruits, important antioxidants, reducing inflammation, get in that fiber, eat your vegetables and fruits. I'm such a classic dietitian <laughs> saying this, but thank you all are very clear, paying attention. All right. All right, so by consuming the right foods and getting all the right nutrients that our body needs, there are so much that we can do within our control to really prevent cardiovascular disease and protect our heart. So the next slides, we're going to talk a lot about the importance of specific nutrients that really supports our heart health, including fruits and vegetables, again, omega-3 fatty acids, and also why we should choose low sodium foods. So we have all heard like eat your fruits and vegetables and this is something that is really engraved in most people's mind I think we have heard it basically our whole life but what does it really mean and does it really mean anything but and why is it so powerful that everyone says this uh, statement uh, yes it is actually pretty powerful in preventing and reducing the chance of uh, developing heart disease and the reasons for that is it contains so many nutrients phytochemicals, it includes fiber, vitamin C, antioxidants, potassium, all the flavonoids and carotenoids, and uh, all these nutrients that together really act um, to fight inflammation, it increases, it uh, decreases cholesterol in our body, it improves the vascular and our immune function, it even reduces blood pressure, there's so many things it together does not one single nutrients, but all together, it really has a powerful in, impact on our body. Uh, all the antioxidants really reduces the reactive oxygen species and reduce DNA damage in our body. Um, high fruits and vegetable intake is also associated with reduced risk of developing adipo excess adipose tissue, so becoming overweight and obesity. And also, if you are really focusing on eating a whole foods diet, it also means you're mostly likely going to eat less of unhealthy types of food, which are high in trans fat, sugar, as well as sodium. So the bottom line is it has tons of ben benefits. So eat your fruits and vegetables and berries and um, you will protect your heart. So going into the next slide, um, when we think of heart health and nutrition, 
like I was mentioning, it's not just one nutrient that is going to get all the credit for preventing heart disease. It's rather the combination of the overall dietary pattern. And that's how the nutrients become so powerful working together. So uh, like I mentioned, the high intake of fiber, antioxidants, all these vitamins and minerals, um, polyphenols, as well as a low intake of salt, low intake of refined carbohydrates and low intake of trans fat. Um, this really translates into a dietary pattern that consists of more nutrient dense foods um, and also really minimizing processed food as well. So the longevity diet that we often talk a lot about uh, is basically a dietary pattern that really supports our heart health by reducing oxidation inflammation in our body it reduces the blood pressure, it reduces fasting glucose levels, and really controls our body weight, which again then is going to protect uh, us from developing cardiovascular disease. Thank you, Frida. Okay, let's go over the importance of omega-3 fatty acids. This is huge. I've had patients in the past, I remember one patient in particular who was an avid cyclist. He was a plant-based. He had been plant-based for over a year. And he said, Katie, what's the deal? I have high triglycerides and I'm super athletic and I'm a healthy weight and I'm plant-based. Why are my lip, why is my lipid profile so poor? And I, looking at his intake, I was saying, oh, you're not taking in enough omega-3 fatty acids. All right. So I'm so beyond excited to make sure that everybody gets in enough omega-3s. Just within a couple of weeks of working with me and making sure he does take in enough omega-3s, taking an algae-derived omega supplement and incorporating chia seeds and flax seeds, within a couple of weeks, his triglycerides went down and his blood lipid profile was golden and he felt so much better. So these are essential. They're called essential fatty acids for a reason. Our bodies are not able to make them with other precursors, which like saturated fat, other types of fat, like triglycerides, our bodies are able to produce. And omega-3s are so essential. They're the starting point for making hormones that regulate blood clotting, contraction, as well as relaxation of artery walls, and omega-3s, they have a lot to do with preventing inflammation. So when it comes to omega-3s as well, if you're obviously not taking it enough, your body's going to overproduce the unhealthy fats like saturated fat and triglycerides. There are a few different types of omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3s themselves are actually the precursor to the DHA and EPA, you've probably heard so much about. So DHA and EPA, those are coming from fish and those are quite bioavailable. In just four ounces of salmon, there's about three grams of omega-3. Um, this, when it comes to how much omega-3 do you need, you only need, you know, in a day, you're only going to need about half that really. So in three tablespoons of ground flax for a woman, I'm pretty sure you only need 2.6 grams a day. And for a man, I recommend you take in 3.2 grams per day. And if that's coming from a fish source, you probably need half that much because it gets so readily absorbed. The ALA version of the omega-3, that's the precursor to the DHA and EPA. So we want to make sure if you are avoiding fish for whatever reason, maybe it's mercury, maybe it's PCB, whatever you might be concerned about, taking an algae-derived omega supplement, these do have preformed DHA and EPA, and those are going to be a great source as well. Um, but as you can see here, these are the top four sources that I'll recommend that people eat on a daily basis. And just three tablespoons of walnuts or ground flax, you're going to get your daily need for these. And also there's some... ALA and omega-3 in lots of other foods as well, like leafy greens and other types of oils, but these tend to be the top sources. And last thing I want to say about this, when it comes to flax, chia, hemp, these are polyunsaturated fats. So you don't want to cook with them. You will never see flax oil just on the shelf. It's always going to be in the refrigerated section because it's quite heat sensitive. And when it comes to absorbing these essential fats, your chia seeds should be soaked 
or else you're just going to see them in the toilet come out the other end. The chia seeds are a great source of fiber when they're not soaked, but we want those omega-3s. So make sure they're soaked and make sure that your flax is ground. And to keep them lasting longer, you might want to keep them in the refrigerator because they are heat sensitive. Great. Thank you so much, Katie, for sharing those very useful tips. Uh, so low sodium, that's another thing we often hear about when we think about reducing the risk of heart disease. Uh, why is that? Well, first of all, sodium does play a role. It's a mineral that plays an, role, an important role in our body. We need it to conduct nerve impulses, contract and relax muscles, and also to maintain the proper balance of water and minerals in our body. So it's not a complete useless mineral. However, we only need about 500 milligrams of, of sodium daily to, um, for these vital functions in our body. Uh, however, because we do eat so much processed foods, imagine different cheeses, processed meats, and other types of processed foods, tons of salt for many reasons, flavor, increased shelf life, among others, and we do get an overabundance of this mineral. So that's why... Uh, we have to be mindful about sodium because this in, it makes us retain water in our body. And this, again, can increase our blood pressure. So one, if you look at one teaspoon of, teaspoon of salt includes 2,300 milligrams of sodium. That's, all, that's the daily recommended intake. It's not a lot at all. Like it's very little. So this is the reason we have to be very mindful about our sodium intake. Um, and we're going to share a few tips how we can be mindful about this. So if we, for example, look at the next slide, we see a couple of nutrition facts label. And um, we will see one on the left side here and then one on the right side. So one tool is to use this nutrition facts label to kind of navigate the sodium intake. So first of all, we do want to know the daily value. So if we look at this nutrition facts label, we can see uh, the percentage. Maybe, Katie, can you point at the percentage daily value? It's a lot of writing on this uh, nutrition facts label. So these are reference amounts of nutrients to consume or not to exceed each day. So it gives you percentage like here it says sodium, 1% of the daily uh, percent value. So that's one thing. We want to use the percentage daily value as a tool. And then we want to also pay attention to the serving size. So for this one, for example, uh, 100 grams of whatever this item is contain 10 milligrams of sodium. So this is one way to pay attention to the nutrition facts label. And then going to the next slide, we have more um, additional advice. So for example, preparing your own food, you're in charge of how much sodium or salt you're putting into your food. Uh, we can add flavor without adding sodium. Herbs, spices, garlic, onion powder, lemon juice. There's so many ways we can spice up our food without necessarily reaching out for the salt. Uh, even if you have some canned food, you can rinse the food the canned food, you will get rid of a lot of the sodium. That's a great way to reduce the sodium intake. Reduce the portion size is another great way. And when you're out at a restaurant, focusing on whole foods, uh, ordering low sodium options. And also if you ever have like prepared sauces, spice mixes, these have a tendency to contain a lot of salt. So you want preferably avoid those. Um, even removing the salt shaker from the table, another simple step you can do. And then finally, this one, I like the one, don't be fooled by fancy salt names. These day we have the pink Himalaya salt, kosher salt, sea salt. It's all these fancy names, but in the end of the day, it's salt and it does do the same to your body as table salt. So uh, these are just some tips you can take with you. Uh, on our next slide, uh, please write in the chat box, which would be the better option to buy? Option A on the left side here or option B? And please feel free to write it in the chat box. Let's see what you have to say. B, 
That is correct. So if we look at it, so on the left side, sodium 480 milligrams versus on the right side, B, it has 260 milligrams. So when you are in the store, you're looking at two tomato sauces. So I'm not saying like, oh, you cannot buy tomato sauce or anything processed. But if you are going to choose between two options, look at it, compare the label. You see one has a lot less sodium than the others. Well, that may indicate maybe that's a better option to buy than the others. So it can be very confusing going to the store. There's a billion options. But if you have a few uh, things that you're looking for, you it can help you navigate this process. So reducing inflammation and reversing coronary artery disease. So with plant-based nutrition, just like we have the nutrition facts label that tells us our sodium, which I like to recommend making sure that you have less than 300 milligrams of sodium per serving of whatever you buy, look for less than 300 milligrams. We also want to look for things that are, of course, heart healthy. And classic example of this is the oatmeal. Across the board, oatmeal can reduce cholesterol. It's been shouted from the rooftops. Oatmeal can reverse can reduce cholesterol levels and be heart healthy, not just because of the soluble fiber, but also because whole grains, oats, and lots of vegetables and fruits, they contain lots of soluble fiber. They contain lots of antioxidants. It's not just the oatmeal. Soluble fiber and all kinds of fiber and antioxidants, et cetera, these are going to really help the microbiome and decrease inflammation. Heart disease, it's truly an inflammation cause disease and we want to reduce inflammation. And oats do have antioxidants in them as well as soluble fiber. We want to make sure that we're witnessing not only are the oats, but brown rice, quinoa, carrots. <laughs> There's so many foods that contain these incredible properties. So eating whole grains and plant foods may be just as effective as taking a statin drug. Something that's interesting about oats, I read a study comparing um, if you're just going to eat sausage, egg, and cheese or eat those with some oats, your cholesterol after just one meal can be significantly decreased if you're eating oats with the sausage, egg, and cheese. It's going to be much better, of course, to nix, take away the sausage, egg, and cheese and just eat the bowl of oatmeal. Um, however, it's really fascinating. The antioxidants, the fiber in plant foods, not just oatmeal, all plant foods really can be helpful with this. Most plant foods for sure. Um, another example of a plant food that's quite the superfood when it comes to heart health, if you've heard of the supplements with supplementing with beets, it's really popular for athletes now to be supplementing with beet powder. Um, beets, they contain nitrates, which get converted into nitric oxide, which helps a lot with blood flow and oxygen utilization. And not only does this help with athletic performance, but of course it helps to prevent and maybe even reverse heart disease. And when it comes to sodium versus potassium, sodium, especially excess sodium, has been shown to stiffen our blood vessels and lead to further atherosclerosis, whereas potassium can help to relax our blood vessels. And potassium helps to release that nitric oxide, which is what is so amazing at improving our oxygen utilization. And this ties in with what I mentioned before about blood pressure lowering medications. Those nitroglycerin drugs are really just trying to mimic what nitric oxide does. And this is a naturally occurring compound that our bodies are able to create from nitrates in beets, arugula, and other plant-based foods. So other nitrate sources, these include beets and beet greens, of course, arugula, butter leaf lettuce, spring mix greens, Swiss chard, radishes, turnips, watercress, bok choy, absolutely incredible sources of nitrates, not to be confused with nitrites, which nitrites are basically preservatives and processed meats. We do not want to eat nitrites, but nitrates naturally occurring in vegetables, amazing. And don't use antibiotic mouthwash because the mouthwash will actually kill the good bacteria that can help with the conversion of nitrates into nitric, into nitric oxide. All right, so no antibacterial mouthwash. <laughs> also, let's increase our potassium sources. Getting in more potassium can help negate any negative effect from excess sodium and really help to lower blood pressure as well. 
potassium sources, all of these sources actually have more potassium than a banana. So a potato and sweet potato, lima beans, and these are reasonable, reasonable amounts, about a cup to like a half a cup to a cup of properly cooked lima beans, acorn squash, again, Swiss chard, spinach, four ounces of wild salmon, dried apricots, amazing, one pomegranate, coconut water. These are great sources of potassium. Um, yeah, as you can see here, one sweet potato has 855 milligrams of potassium and one banana has 487 milligrams of potassium. And when it comes to sodium, we only need about 1500 to 2000 milligrams of sodium a day, like 2000 is going to be probably the max. Whereas with potassium, recommendations are about 3000, 3000 plus, like 3200, 3400 most people do not take in enough potassium. So get in those sweet potatoes. I love this picture of the roasted beet and the roasted potato fries. Um, that looks really good. Overarching takeaways, just like we mentioned in the first webinar about the longevity diet and about the fasting webinar, we want to have an overnight fast of 12 to 14 hours. This is really going to help reduce inflammation, reduce any metabolic issues and possibility with um, having a lot of cravings and having diabetes, right? Making sure we're fasting overnight, balanced plant-based longevity diet, making sure that half your plate has got some fruits and vegetables in there, whole grains, plant-based sources of protein, specific foods to avoid. We want to really avoid processed and red meats, avoiding foods that have over 300 milligrams of sodium per serving. So make sure to look at that nutrition facts label Everyone go in your fridge after this, look at your processed meats, go look at your cheeses. They're probably, if you have them, I hope you don't, they probably have a lot more milligrams of sodium per serving than you might think, right? If you look at salami, these things that you might think are more, um, yeah, just take a look at that. <laughs> don't wanna eat anything that has over 300 milligrams per serving. Um, also avoiding fried foods, highly processed foods. If you ever have an option between baked and fried, choose the baked option. Right. And specific foods to include, just like this beautiful picture, we've got arugula, asparagus, that whole grains, we've got healthy fats there, lots of different vegetables and quality carbohydrates, quality carbohydrates, that means our starchy vegetables like potatoes, corn, even zucchinis, and um, quinoa, like the whole grain, rather than white breads and baked goods and that type of thing. We don't want to just be having fruit juices and things that are going to spike our blood sugar quality carbs contain all that amazing fiber. SMASH fish, that's an acronym for our low mercury fish that has those omega-3 fatty acids, get them wild caught. SMASH stands for sardines, mackerel, anchovies, salmon, and herring. And of course, including nuts, seeds, olives, avocado, and including those sources of soluble fiber. So getting in lots of berries, oats, and soaked chia seeds are a really, really great source of soluble fiber. All right, so quiz time. I hope you all paid attention. So very first question, again, feel, uh, please write it in the chat box. So what are three foods you should eat every day to prevent heart disease? Let's see. Fruits, Hi. vegetable, nuts, great. That's three great options. Yeah, also fish is great. Nuts and seeds, vegetable, fruits, grains. Awesome. Many great foods. Awesome. And it looks like you're people answering. If you want to click the drop down menu and answer for everyone to see, but I guess it's not necessary. Yes, vegetables, fruits, grains. All right. I hope everyone was paying attention. What are three sources of omega-3 fatty acids? Very, very important. Chia, flax, salmon, nice. What else? Any, anyone else? Let's see. We've got 50 people in here. Only a few people are answering. Hopefully you all paid attention. Algae, walnuts, chia, flax, yes. Algae, nice. Ooh, yeah, hemp. Awesome. Yeah, hemp seeds are amazing. Hemp seeds are also a great source of zinc. Greens, nice. Great. All right, so last question. If a canned soup has 600 milligrams of sodium, should you get it? No. <laughs> no. 
Yes, we want to try to find foods that has less than 300 preferable per serving. No, great. That's awesome. You all paid attention. Awesome. Yay. Okay, now it's time for the Q&A section of this webinar. So please, whatever questions you had, I know we had a lot of questions throughout. Um, please go into the Q&A feature and we're able to access those now. Yes, and I did answer some of them in the writing, but we can still uh, go through them. Okay, awesome. There, yeah. Let me see. Um, somebody asked, what brand of algae-derived omega-3s do you recommend? Unfortunately, as a nonprofit foundation, we are not able to recommend specific uh, products, specific brands. Um, however, I do have a consumer labs. Um, it's a third-party testing site where I can see all of the ones that definitely prove that they're safe. They don't have any toxins in them. And they are um, they do what they say that they're going to do, right? They make sure that they're well absorbed and they actually are what they say on the label. And I can send, I send my patients a list of those approved products by third-party testing sites. So that's a question. Um, if you'd like to use that code and get 30% off of an initial consultation with me, I'll be able to move forward and make sure that those would be helpful for you when it comes to, um, yeah, a brand to recommend. That's a great question. I don't know off the top of my head all of the approved products. So I see one question, does apple cider vinegar in water really reduce blood spikes in diabetics? So I know apple cider vinegar is like a hack that someone uses to reduce the spike of blood sugar. It could be very individual, but um, the science behind it or the research, it's not like super strong, but I know people have their own experience with it. So um, it's definitely a lot of people who benefit also have easier digest digestive um, experiences by taking some apple cider vinegar. So. Yeah, apple cider vinegar is great. It actually can for sure reduce blood sugar spikes. Yeah, there's there's a lot of research on that. It's crazy. It's like people are like, what the heck, this cure-all apple cider vinegar. But yeah, um, it, it definitely can. Um, somebody asked, I love fruit. And is it healthy to eat a lot of fruit? Oh my gosh, yes, please. I think it's so sad to hear when people are afraid to eat fruit. And it this is very individualized as well. I highly would, I would love to know your background, your health history, your goals, and see how much fruit is going to be optimal for you. I will across the board never say anybody should reduce their intake of berries, blueberries, raspberries, strawberries, um, foods that have seeds like that, like pomegranates. They're definitely not going to spike your blood sugar. And they they actually can help reduce blood sugar. If you add blueberries to a high carbohydrate meal, like adding blueberries to pancakes or to muffins or to oatmeal, the blueberries will help reduce a blood sugar spike because they're so high in fiber and antioxidants. So berries are going to be amazing. But when it comes to sweeter fruits like bananas, mangoes, um, dried fruits, I don't necessarily recommend going crazy with those. Those could for sure lead to spikes. Um, and I highly recommend avoiding fruit juices. Do not drink fruit juice, please. This is just going to jack up your blood sugar, just like drinking Coca-Cola. All right. So when it comes to eating fruit, it's going to be better eaten after a meal, after eating a salad, after eating some vegetables and a source of protein. So you don't get a spike, but fruit, it's a source of energy. There's so many antioxidants and vitamins, minerals, fiber, hydration. We love fruit. I, um, but this is individualized. I'm not going to, I hope you don't leave this and are like she says to eat fruit and goes and eats an entire watermelon every meal like that's not what I recommend it's important to have balanced healthy meals including fruit yeah and I like that you emphasize that it's very individualized because a person with that type 2 diabetes definitely need to watch out for like high sugar or fruits with higher glycemic load versus uh, a person who is completely healthy and has normal stable blood sugar levels so it's very individualized, but overall fruits does provide a lot of nutrients for sure. All right, um, what other questions? Mm. 
Yeah, there's, I think we've uh, answered most of the questions here. I'm going through it. I found another one. Um, someone asked, is oil healthy? And this used to be at least like in the whole food plant-based movement, people were like oil free, salt free. And people, uh, oil kind of got a bad reputation, at least in like the plant food world. <laughs> um, oil, of course, like what are we comparing it to and what kind of oil are you referring to? So when it comes to olives versus olive oil, I might say it's going to be healthier to eat the olive because olives, they do have a lot more fiber, right? It's the whole food. Whereas olive oil, it's still fantastic, especially a, a high quality product that's been cold pressed and it's like really high quality. The olive is, it's just a lot more difficult to overdo it with calories. So with olive oil um, in just, you know, a tablespoon or so, it's like maybe even just a teaspoon, it's like 100, 120 calories. So you can easily overdo it with oils because they are such concentrated calories. And it depends on you. Not only are we depending on, okay, what type of oil is it and how much are you eating? What are we comparing it to? But as far as it, is it healthy for you? I'm gonna go back to the answer of, please schedule a consultation with us. I wanna see what are your goals um, when it comes to is, is oil healthy for you? I might say no. I might say no because you're you're needing to lose weight and it's gonna maybe you want to choose um, more nuts and seeds and other sources of fat that maybe are less calorie dense that provide that healthy fat that can help you feel fuller longer. Um, but in general, I want to say that oil is fantastic. Yeah, especially high quality oils. And this is a lot different than you know canola oil, corn oil. There's different types of oils that may be actually exacerbating or making inflammation worse, right? So to ask is oil healthy, that's very, very broad. I wanna to get to know you and see what I can recommend as far as a healthy oil and a healthy amount for you. Yeah. Um, yeah, when it comes to oils though, like some contains more omega-3 versus omega-6 and more inflammatory. So uh, for example, like sunflower, sap, uh, flower oils are not like the best options but then again what do you compare it to and yeah so definitely uh, schedule an appointment with us if you want to get a more individualized uh, recommendation and we do take new patients so uh, feel free to write down our emails or go on our website and you can schedule a consultation with one of our dietitians um Um, somebody asked, how do you book a consultation? Nice. Yeah, the link is wow. in the chat box. So yeah. anybody, um, I, there's a lot of questions here and we're not going to be able to get to all of them. Please, if you have any questions, click a, go ahead and click that link and here on the slide, um, please, you have our contact information. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions concerning moving forward with the consultation or if you want to tell us more um, about your goals specifically and we can see if that would be a good fit for us to help. Exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah. And if, if you have a more personalized question as well, feel free to email us because sometimes we need a little more information from you in order to give you an appropriate and adequate answer. So you can always email us questions as well. Okay. I'm going to answer one more question. Someone asked, can we use olive oil to fry? Do not fry foods. We don't want to deep fry anything. Don't fill up your pan and fry anything. No fried foods. I, I really like that's one number one food that I will avoid is anything fried. Do not. Okay. Olive oil. Yes. It's safe to cook with, and it may be better to even just saute with some water and a little bit of olive oil. We don't want to be frying anything. That's my answer to that question. And when it comes to baking, a great way to decrease calories and fat is using parchment paper instead of, instead of needing to add extra oil to prevent sticking. Um, but yeah, olive oil is fine and that should be fine at high heat upwards of like 450 when you're baking or roasting foods. Um, but I don't recommend any fried foods. No. All right. So I think we can go to the next slides. Yeah. So here's a reminder of the summer promotions. 
Um, 30% off an initial consultation with your dietitians from the Create Cures Foundation. The link is in the chat box. I really hope to, if you join this webinar, you know, you probably have goals for a long, healthy life, right? You want to make sure you're optimizing your nutrition. This 30% off, I hope, helps you know, negate any fears you have about getting started, getting in contact with one of us and the Longevity Masterclass. Go ahead to education.createcures.org and learn more. It's super fascinating what we've got going on. Awesome. So today was our fourth webinar of the Longevity Diet webinar series. Our next one will be in August the 31st. So in a month from now, uh, same time, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Please write down it and mark it in your calendar. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, attending our webinar. And we really look forward to see you again. And please also share the YouTube link uh, tomorrow when it's recorded uh, or uploaded with anyone you know who you may think will benefit from some of the advice. So we look forward to see you soon again. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful night.